Good morning, everyone. So welcome to uh, class. So today we're going to work on finishing chapter two. Monday we're going to start chapter three. Uh, we should be through chapter three by uh, next Friday's lecture. Um, we will then have two days the following week, Monday and Wednesday, in lecture to try to, to uh, review some stuff from chapters one through three. And then our test is that uh, Wednesday. So test isn't next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday in the evening. So we have um, still quite a few lectures before that exam comes up. It's through chapter three. So uh, we're going to look at naming acids, binary molecular compounds, hydrocarbons today. We'll review some of the naming stuff from ionic compounds. And then we'll um, look first actually today at a problem on uh, atomic weights. So there's two questions open on Top Hat right now. One of them is just a simple survey, um, extra credit points for just kind of curious how many quizzes you've done. Feel free to be honest. If you haven't done any, that's fine. Um, just curious at how many of those daily quizzes you guys have looked at. And then also there's uh, a question to start us off with today, just on calculating the abundance or um, trying to figure out the abundance of the heavier isotope of chlorine in a natural sample given the atomic weights of its two natural existing isotopes are about 35 and close to 37 uh, AMU. Turns out chlorine, we talked about this before, exists as just two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to think about that one. So funny. Watching the video from like Ellen Hopsey, I don't know if we're so mad at you. So try to wrap this one up.
Okay, so let's take a look here. So the answer ends up working out to 24.1. We'll show and go through a solution in a moment. I just want to give a quick reminder of how Top Hat works in terms of grading. Um, the one thing is in Top Hat, your total score isn't exactly your lecture score. So you just have to remember, if you look up your grade in Top Hat, it's going to just, uh, reflect the total percentage of points that you earned. The way I determine grades at the end of the semester is um, in the way we're tracking scores, you get half a point if you just answer. If you're correct, then you get an extra 0.75 points. And then we sort of total these all up by the number of questions that we ask you on, on the content. Occasionally, we ask bonus questions that we just give you the point and a quarter if you answer the question. Um, and so then we have those uh, extra credit problems, you might call them. And then at the end of the semester, I total up all your points, you know, so maybe put a big summation sign here, if you will, that we're going to sum up all your points and just divide by the total number of chemistry questions we ask. And so what that means is you really only need to earn, on average, one point per question um, to, to get, end up with 100%. We do max it at 100%, so you can't go over 100%. Um, so these extra credit problems and that little 0.25 bonus you're earning every time you're correct helps you out of uh, questions maybe you miss. If you're a little bit late to class, you don't get to answer that first question. Well, if you go answer the extra credit question, you'll buy your points you know, for that one missed question today. You know, so that's um, briefly how the Top Hat point works. I have to do that grading at the end of the semester. Like I download your, your scores from Top Hat, do that arithmetic, and re-upload the scores into Carmen. So um, I don't want you guys stressing out about answering questions if you're wrong here in class. Um, but so then looking at the actual question, we want to know the abundance of the heavier isotope. There's one key piece of information in this problem, and it's really the key idea behind this topic, is that when we're talking about calculating an average atomic weight as the sum of the fraction of a given isotope times the atomic weight of that isotope summed over all natural occurring isotopes for a given element, that this is what we list on the periodic table. So you just have to know that if you need or if you're dealing with an average atomic weight for a given element, that you look to the periodic table to get that average. So for chlorine, it's 35.453 um, AMU. And so then we'd have the fraction of the lighter isotope times the atomic weight of the lighter isotope. And then we'd have plus the fraction of the heavier isotope times the atomic weight of the heavier isotope. And that's going to equal 35.453. OK, now, one problem solving trick, there's like two problem solving tricks here. One would be that since there's only two, that these have to add up to one. Like the fraction of the lighter plus the heavier have to sum up to be equal to one. So it's like either one or the other. So if it's 50% one, it's 50% the other. So it's 0.5 one, 0.5 the other. If it's 75% one, it's 25% the other. So 0 0.75, 0 0.25. Now, where the other trick comes in this problem is, so you can mathematically plug in and solve for one variable and solve an algebraic expression, and that's fun and dandy. But the thing is, we only have four choices. And we also have the idea that we can kind of apply some thought here, that if you have lighter isotopes about 35, heavier is about 37, the average is closer to 35. What does that tell us about the abundance of the lighter compared to the heavier? That the Abundance is going to have to be much higher on the lighter isotope to get that average closer to the lighter isotope's mass. Okay? And so what you might guess is that it's about 35 and a half um, compared to 35.0, 37.0. So that seems like probably about a quarter is going to be the heavier, and about three quarters will be the lighter. So what you could do is just go plug in your fraction. The heavier is 0 0.241. The fraction of the lighter is 1 minus that and check and see if that calculates out to the average atomic weight. Um, and if that ends up being wrong, maybe you then say, OK, maybe I'm mistaken in your thoughts. And you can go through and either plug in the other answers or just go solve the algebra. The algebra solving is a little bit longer, I think. So I think just in terms of time on a multi multiple choice test, if you're using a problem solving strategy, you save yourself some time. So I think use problem solving strategies if they make sense. If not, use the mathematics. If you want to see the mathematics worked out here, one of the daily quizzes goes through a problem like this mathematically, and I give the sort of algebra walk through it in the uh, video answer. Um, so we will uh, forego just a discussion of mathematics here and um, just you know, reiterate that the answer ends up being about 25% or 24.1% is that heavier isotope. OK, so let's bring us back to where we were at um, last lecture. We were going through naming primarily of cations and anions. <laughs> The big role for anions is if it's a simple atomic ion, so you're just talking one atom with a charge, you're just looking at the root name of the element with the IDE suffix. 
So chloride, bromide, iodide, oxide, nitride. So very simple naming in terms of the simple atomic ions following a general trend. Um, we have a couple ions, superoxide, peroxide, where we have two oxygens bonded together with a charge. Um, we have some common ions that we see, like hydroxide, acetate um, ions. And then we also then had these um, sort of what we might call oxyanions. So the oxyanions are the case where you had an element with oxygen bonded to it with a particular count, particular charge. And so if we look at sulfate, it turns out that sulfate with four oxygens and a two minus is just the most prevalent, if you will, or the most common of these anions with sulfur. So that's the one that takes the ATE ending. Now I think what we need to memorize is for carbon, it's three and a two minus. For nitrogen, it's three and a minus. For phosphorus, it's four and a three minus. If we memorize these common representative oxyanions, um, likewise for the halogens, it's three and a minus. So the ClO3 minus, BRO3 minus, IO3 minus, but all those have the simple ATE ending on the root name of the element. And then from there, if oxygen is either added or removed from the formula, we can have a simple nomenclature system where if you add an O, you just add a per in front. If you remove an O, you change the ending to ite. If you remove a second O, you go hypoite. And then that full range of like four ions really only happens with the, uh, with the halogen oxyanion. So really only chlorine, bromine, and iodine do that full range of extent. And we're not trying to get you to memorize, like uh, a test question wouldn't be, does, does, hydro, th does hypocarbonite exist? Like that's not what we're gonna ask you. We just wanna be able to give you a formula, have you name it. If we give you a name, be able to sketch the formula. We're not trying to figure out why these are the formulas. We're not trying to figure out um, anything other than a name to formula, formula to name through this nomenclature system. And then the last one for the anions was if you add a H out in front, you're actually adding an H plus, so you're changing the charge. So if you imagine carbonate is a two minus, if you add an H plus to that, you knock this charge down to minus overall. So when you write the formula, HCO3 minus. So that would be the hydrogen carbonate ion. Uh, now, some, sometimes this is called the bicarbonate ion. That's a more common name. We're trying to get you guys to learn the systematic formal name. So we're not gonna test you on the informal or common names. Um, and so we're just gonna make sure that you know things like hydrogen phosphate is HPO4. Instead of three minus, it's now down to a two minus. In terms of dihydrogen phosphate, so two H's, so two H pluses now down to a minus charge. So let's go, oh, oh, let's review the uh, cations real quick, that the atomic cations are just the metal names, so lithium, sodium, potassium ion, rubidium ion, cesium, those are our common alkalis. Um, alkaline only form plus two charged ions. You can get those charges just from the placement of those elements on the periodic table. Aluminum is three over, so it's kind of like nitrogen adds three to go to a three minus. Aluminum can lose three electrons, go to a three plus. So these cations, or these uh, elements only form cations with those particular charges. Um, they don't form any other charged cations. Uh, zinc two plus, silver two plus, are two uh, transition metals that form cations with just those particular charges. So zinc ion is zinc two plus, silver, silver plus. And then the other transition metals, we would give you the Roman numeral. So like we'd say Fe two plus would be iron three, or excuse me, iron two. The Roman numeral is the charge. So iron three plus would be iron three. So we use a Roman numeral system for all the other transition metals where we can't easily predict the charge just based on periodic table placement. Let's put that together, look at this question here, and just try to address which of these name and formula pairs is incorrect. So give this one a try. Oh, it's more of a, the, the reason why I don't show the average scores is it's just hard for me to keep recording the lecture and switch apps. So, yeah, the, um, if you guys want, I can, 
think of a way I can share those. I mean, I can just say them after the question. Yeah. yeah. No, I wish there was a way. That one's about two thirds right. So the opening question, two thirds of the class were correct. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out how to display the results. I almost had it figured out, but um, okay. So this one here, the right answer is the copper one nitrite is the incorrect. So let's do a quick review. So what? What, the way I would approach this problem is bromate is a three with a minus, so the per is the BrO four, so that would be sodium per bromate. So that's correctly named. Calcium's a two plus, phosphite's a three minus, PO3 is the phosphite, so that would be CA3, PO3 two. So we're kind of checking the formulas and the charges that they're all paired together right, along with the ending of the names being properly matched. Nitrite, of course, is NO2 minus, um, and uh, not NO3 minus, so this would be copper one nitrate. So C is the incorrect one, silver plus, this is kind of showing us we don't need that Roman numeral for silver because it's always silver plus, so Ag2CO3. And then ammonium is NH4 plus chlorite, uh, chlorate is ClO3 minus, so that would be ammonium um, chlorate. Okay, so 86% was the one on this one. Uh, so I'll, I'm trying to figure out how to show these percentages, you guys, since I, I don't know, I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't think that you guys necessarily would want to see that, but. Uh, so, okay, let's look at this question here. Before I open this up, this is actually an intricate question because it deals with something we haven't quite talked about yet, which is that these ions here, the peroxide and the oxide ion, that these are only going to form ionic compounds in certain cases with things like the alkali cations and the alkaline cations. And they're only going to form under some very kind of peculiar experimental conditions. These aren't very ordinary compounds. 
they're not gonna form with things like transition metals. The reason why I bring this up is when you see a formula like TiO2, you might be confused. Could that be a peroxide or a superoxide? Well, it's kind of the checklist would be, is it an alkali or an alkaline cation? It's not, so it's just going to be the only other type of anion oxygen forms, which is that oxide ion. So oxygen here has to be an O2 minus ion. So think about the um, charge of oxygen, what that's gonna mean for the charge of titanium to work out the name of this uh, um, ionic compound. So give this, give this one a try. So one more minute. like titanium yeah. it's from like knowing that oxides are minus two and there's two of them so there has to be a minus four and so that's how you work out it's a four we'll go over in just a second Okay, so let's take a look at this one here. So titanium's not one of the alkali or alkaline cations. That means that oxygen here is just a simple oxide ion. Now what that means is there's two of the oxygen, so there's a total of minus four charge coming from the two um, oxide ions. This would be like, you know, CaCl2 would have two minuses coming from the two chlorides, overall plus two charge on the, chlor on the calcium. So what I like to do is write the charge of the ions up above, and I like to do the math down below. If I have to do math to work out what the charges are, um, that looks like math. I'm going to do math instead. Um, it is, yeah, you got to be careful. You never know. Um, so we got a minus four from the oxygen um, ions, the oxide ions. So we have to have a plus four for titanium. So this is how we work out titanium plus four, titanium four oxide. Okay, now let's, let's take a quick glimpse here at what this really means because there's a, quite a big difference between, say, a titanium. Um, oxide or some molecule paired up with an oxide or a peroxide. So what this would sort of look like, let me make this a little smaller. This would be the case of having a titanium ion. You think of that as like sort of a, um, like an atom or a sphere with a charge, and then an oxide ion with its charge, and another oxide ion perhaps on the other side separate. You might think the negative charges want to get away from each other. So you're going to have the minus ions on either side. That's what titanium peroxide would look like. Now compare that with something like Na2 O2 or NaO2, if you have a case of an oxide or a peroxide, they're only going to come up in the cases of the ions you already know the charge of in, in, in terms of the metal ion. So they're only going to form in these alkali or alkaline cases where you know sodium has a plus charge, of, a charge of plus one. So in the first compound, you have a total plus two for the two sodiums. That's going to mean the entire O2 group has a minus two charge. Okay, so the O2 where the entire group has a minus two charge. Um, that's the peroxide ion. So in that case, this molecule is going to look a little different. The oxide ion 
has two oxygens bonded together, each have a charge of, a, of minus one, and then your sodium cations might be on the opposite sides. So it's sort of seeing that your ions are going to disperse, distribute, and um, um, sort of connect together, if you will, in some sort of an arrangement, but the molecular ions remain attached together through some sort of covalent bonding. We'll talk about the nature of that covalent bonding later, so you don't need to predict really what oxide ion looks like or carbonate ion. You don't need to really sketch these types of structures here. I'm just trying to show you that when we say like peroxide, that that ion's remaining intact. Same thing with NaO2. This here is a plus, and then hence just a minus charge for the entire collection of the two oxygens. And so that's going to be two oxygens connected, maybe a minus charge being spread across the two oxygens. So then we just have a sodium plus charge attracted to that negative charge. So kind of you can think how structurally these compounds might look a little bit different from each other. Um, and that the molecular ions are going to remain attached, and then the atomic ions are going to remain separated from each other, and then they're just going to alternate plus minus, plus minus in some sort of fashion. We're not predicting the order of that um, sort of ionic attractions or anything like that. That comes up a little bit in chapter 12, um, but nothing that we're predicting in terms of really what these look like other than just the ions dispersing. So that's really what, to, what, what I want us to think about is how the oxides, like two separate oxygen ions, and then a cation in the middle. Okay, so moving on from this, the, um, what we're going to do is name inorganic acids. And so the acid is kind of like those hydrogen oxy anions, but after we fully neutralize the charge. Um, so this might be looking at something like HCl in terms of hydrochloric acid. Um, and we'll go through the names in just a second. I'm going to write in a couple examples here. Um, that something like you know, hydrogen sulfate ion would be HSO4 minus. You add that second H, um, you might think that would be dihydrogen sulfate, but it's not dihydrogen sulfate because now we name this for being a charge neutral acid. So acids are the um, you know, inorganic acids, neutral and charge in terms of our naming. So once you have a charge neutral molecule, now it's really not an ionic compound. Now like H2SO4 or HClO3, HCl, Notice that there's no metal ion present. So we have no metal nonmetals. These aren't ionic compounds anymore. These are just simply molecular compounds. And so we're going to name them a little bit differently. We're going to name them in the category as being uh, named as acids. And so that one nice way acids are named is they all end in the word acid. So you can usually, in turn, if we give you a name, you'll know it's an acid because the name will end in acid. Um, so the first one, what we want to do, or in all these cases, it's almost like you want to look at that ion underneath the acid. So picture the ion, the, that anion that has H plus added to it, and think about how you would name that sort of plain ion. Like Cl minus would be chloride. Add an H plus to that. The system is going to be hydro in front, and then the root name of the element, so chlor, and then ic acid. So the, the system is hydro ic acid. So you put hydro and then whatever the element is, followed by ic acid. So if you have HBr, this would be hydrobromic acid. You think of HI, hydroiodic acid, HF, hydrofluoric acid. So it's like you're just trying to think, okay, how would I name this thing here? How would I name this ion? So sulfate and chlorate. The anions that end in eight, we just go by ic acid. We get rid of the hydro, we just call it ic acid. So the first one would be chloric acid. So you go to the root name of the molecule, chloric space acid. So sometimes, sometimes I do this little underscore to make sure we see where the space is. So hydrochloric, that's all one word, and then space acid. So chloric space acid, sulfuric acid for the second one. So the ic acids, and I'll rewrite this so humans can decipher what I'm writing. So the ic acid ending implies that the anion that's sort of complementary to or behind the acid, if you will, has an ATE ending. Um, and then lastly, if we look at something like, say, HClO, maybe H3PO3, if we're naming these acids, these anions have the ITE suffix. So phosphite, hypochlorite. So the first one would be hypochlorous acid. And the second one would be phosphate. 
for us acid. So it's OUS acid. So the ending for the ITE derived acids is the OUS acid. So it's either hydroic acid for the simple atomic ions making their acids. Um, it's either ic acid if it's an eight ion in its acid form, if you will, and then it's an OUS or US acid if it's the ite ion in its acid form. And one like last reminder, like the, the big idea here would be if you have things like HClO, HClO2, HClO3, HClO4, you want to have a different name for each one of those substances because they're different compounds. So as you start thinking through nomenclature, sometimes you get a bit lost or confused of why there's so much complexity. It's the complexity is simply in trying to name all the things that exist in a way that's different but yet systematic and very easy to interpret. So I do think the system is relatively easy to interpret. We'll do here. I think you may need to do a couple more examples. That's where maybe the quizzes or the homework come into play. Let's try to find the incorrect name. So one more minute. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, obviously, you guys did pretty good on this one. Um, the, the one thing is that these problems are always very easy once you see. It's almost maybe um, we get a little too much comfort sometimes. We do a problem right after we see the topic. You need to make sure to review this a couple times so that you remember this like two weeks from now. Um, the simplest, uh, the simplistic nature of just thinking that it's SO4, 2 minus, that's the 8. So it would be H2SO4 for sulfuric acid. This would be sulfuric S acid, so that's the wrong one. Um, that is uh, chlor chlorite, so that would be chlorous acid. Acetate's a little strange um, that C2H3O2 is one formula for acetate ion. Another way we sometimes write this is CH3COO minus. Um, it's the same count of carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens. If we write it this way, then sometimes we might write the acid as CH3COOH. The only way that that's sometimes confusing in this chapter is that you get kind of used to seeing the H out in front. So usually when we give acetic acid in like the early part of this class, we usually like to use this formula. So it kind of takes that similar form of the H in front um, and then the anion following. Um, it, those are weird cases. If you have like homework finicky cases, send them to me and I'll contact the publisher. Mastering chemistry, what it can do, it can accept multiple answers. And sometimes they haven't gone through enough um, thought into a problem of how many different variable answers they should accept. So if that's the case, shoot me an email. I can get that fixed um, and, and straightened out.
So HBr would be hydrobromic, and H3PO4 would be phosphoric acid. So, yeah, the eights go to the ic acid, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and that's the one thing with acetate that's a little weird is it doesn't fit kind of your, when you start thinking of eights, ites, and ides, you're thinking of the oxyanions, yeah. The, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we've named. Okay, I don't think there's anything else that we've named that we can name with this system. Okay, I'm actually opening that, but I didn't mean to. Um, so I'm going to close that real quick. You can. Let's get into a discussion of um, um, what we call binary molecular compounds. So we're going to name formulas binary molecular compounds. So binary is two. So this is having two elements present in the formula, but in any particular proportion. And so certain compounds like P and O, you can form like P2O5 or P2O4 or PO3. So some molecules form a net neutral charge, so no charge on these molecules, but where you have like a variable number of atoms present. So we want to have a systematic way of naming these types of compounds. The real simple way is we name the, the second element takes the ide ending, and then we use the mono dot, um, mono di tri tetra um, system for naming the quantity. And then we just don't do mono for the first um, atom. The two ones I like to use kind of first are like CO for carbon monoxide, and that would be the standard name with the system, and then CO2 for carbon dioxide. So we're using the mono in the second element when there's one, and then, um, but not when there's just one of the first. So carbon dioxide for CO2. We use Greek prefixes all the way up to 10 is what we would know. That's like um, the, the penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona is maybe the weird one for nine being nona and 10 being deca. Um, so the, the names here would be like carbon, tetra, and then chloride. So the key, one of the keys is going the IDE ending. Now let's stress here that these are molecular compounds we're naming this way. We're not going back and renaming the ionic compounds that happen to be binary compounds. So we're not renaming the ionics by this system. So we're not looking at TiO2 and renaming it. We're not looking at NaCl. We're keeping those as ionic compounds with the former system that we learned how to name of the metal followed by anion name. So diphosphorus, pentaoxide. Sometimes, um, so if we write diphosphorus, Sometimes these names are shortened to like pentoxide instead of pentaoxide. We're not testing you on those little nuances of the system. Sometimes with, when the, the prefix ends in a vowel and then the element name ends in a vowel, you kind of merge them together. We're not trying to test you on the nuances of if it would be truly pentaoxide or pentoxide. The key is just recognizing the penta for five, oxygen is the element there. So dinitrogen monoxide, but CRO3, well, how would we name CRO3? That goes back to the old system. So this is chromium, six, oxide. So the key for CRO3 is this is an IC, not a molecular compound. So we're naming that by the ordinary system for naming, um, naming ionic compounds. So we're not calling that chromium trioxide. We're keeping the name chromium six, or chromium six plus, Oxide is the ion there. Okay, so uh, that's probably the easiest system that we have to name, but the key is just recognizing those as just the molecular compounds and then just using the relative number of each of the atoms in the formula in your naming. And that we don't do that for ionic compounds for the good reason that we balance those out based on the charges that we know those ions to have. Uh, so organic molecules, we go through very simple organic molecules in chapter two. We only look at alkanes and then the simple alcohols of some of these simple alkanes. So an alkane is a case where you have one or two or three or four carbons or even more. And then you just have the appropriate number of H atoms, single bonded. You don't have to worry a whole lot about the structure per se. We'll get into Lewis structures again later. But the only reason I'm pointing this out is for a reminder that each of the carbons ends up with four total bonds. 
So that might be a good reminder on why like CH4 is the, the hydrocarbon with one carbon, and then C2H6 or CH3, CH3 is the hydrocarbon with two carbons, and that it's not, say, C2H8. You know, so you're not just doubling the CH4 unit, and then also you're not just tripling the CH3 unit either, because you end up with CH3s on the end that gives each of the end carbons three um, hydrogens bonded to them plus one carbon, but the middle one, of course, just has a CH2 group. So this ends up being C3H8. So it just ends up being a good reminder that it ends up kind of going as CH4, and then not C2H8, but C2H6, and then not C3H9, but C3H8, and once you have four, you're just picturing this as CH3, two CH2s, and then a CH3. So you can easily sketch it or write it or think you just have CH3s on the end, CH2s in the middle. And so what about, what would you expect for the, the formula of say the seven, the hepta? So if we had heptane, that's going to be the case where we have seven carbons. Let's work the H count up, but let me actually go back through the names real quick. I didn't name these things. So the, the first one would be methane. The second one would be ethane. Three carbons is propane. It's like your chemistry teacher, we're propane, ha uh ha. -huh. Um, butane is four. And then from there, so like the first four are just a systematic name that you kind of have to memorize, that butane's four carbons with the appropriate number of hydrogens, propane's three, ethane, methane, two and one. And then from there, it just takes the penta, hexa, hepta, followed by the ane ending still. So heptane, that's how we know we have seven carbons. If it was pentane, it would have five carbons. Um, how many hydrogens here? Well, if you have to come back to it, you'd be like, okay, it's CH3 on the end. We have CH2s in the middle, CH3 on the end. There would be five CH2s in the middle to give us seven um, total uh, carbon atoms. And so that would be 10 H's here, plus three, plus three, so that'd be 16. So C7H16 is the formula of heptane. So when you structurally think about it, you can easily arrive at the appropriate H count. Uh, now there is some weird rule, I don't know if you guys know this, it's like CNH2N plus two. That seems harder to memorize to me than just like sketching this out if you have to. You know, so there is some formula of like, you know, CNH2N plus two. But like if you can memorize that, I think it's just probably easier to think of the picture and counting it if you have to and working it out from there. So you're basically just doubling the number of carbons and then adding two. Okay, and so then if we replace any one of the positions with an OH groups, if we imagine, and this actually leads me to an aside, you know, like when we start talking oxyanides, remember we had like ClO3 minus and we were saying if you add an O, if you take an O away, uh, we're not doing that, like there's no chemical reaction where you're just easily doing that. You know, like nature makes these things in some way um, or we make them in the lab by some chemical means, and we're just trying to name the result here. So it's really not like somebody takes methane, plucks an H off, and puts an OH group in its place. But in terms of thinking of how you would name that molecule, that's what we sort of arrive at. If you have CH3 here, and you have an OH group in one of the positions instead of an H, that is the simple alcohol. So that would be methanol. <coughs> And that I'm just trying to say, when we start naming things, it, it really seems as if we're like plucking atoms off, putting new groups in, and chemistry isn't that simple. Um, it's just the naming, we're trying to teach you how to name by thinking through those analogies. So if you replace any of the groups on any one of the H's on ethanol, you get the simple alcohol, so that would be ethanol. Um, then like propanol would be replacing any of the the H's, let's put one on the middle. So that would be propanol. And then if you imagine propanol, you can actually put the OH group on one of the other carbons instead, and that's a different molecule. There is a naming system, I'm not gonna go through it, but this is also a propanol molecule. And then the, um, and I'll write those more neat. I'm sure you can get the spelling. It's pretty probe, anol. That these molecules are what we would call isomers of each other, and that they're isomeric. They're different from each other in the sense that the OH group is put onto a different carbon. Um, 
but, the, but they're still what we would classify as being of the formula C3H8O. So they have the same formula, slightly different structures, so they would be isomers of each other. Now, um, there is a naming system for these in the book. For some reason, I like teaching the naming system because it makes it clear they're different because they have different names. Um, if you're curious, one of these would just be one propanol, the other would be two propanol. Um, but we're not gonna go through the business of really worrying too much about these numbers um, and what they mean in terms of naming. But the, the bigger le lesson, I guess, is that propanol has these isomers. Like, it has the case of having one or the second isomer. But if we look at ethanol or methanol, ethanol is a good one. If you put that OH group anywhere else in the molecule instead, if we had, had plucked off this H or that H or this H, that you end up with the same molecule. It might look different. You might sketch it a little differently. But it's because we're drawing like a two-dimensional shape molecule and really these molecules have some sort of three-dimensional shape to them. So ethanol, methanol don't have, they just have one molecule that they exist as. Any one of those H's replaced with one OH group leads to the same molecule. In the case of propanol and the bigger alcohols, technically you would have different isomers possible. You could name them. It's part of OCHEM probably more than it is GenChem, so we're not going to worry about that naming system here. Let's look at this one question here. It's the one that I accidentally opened up. But it's just trying to get the formula of octane and octanol. All right, one more minute. Okay, so, like I said, we'll fool ourselves into naming things easy after we do an example in class. Make sure to keep looking at quizzes on naming because we want to make sure we remember these names uh, you know, two weeks from now and as we think about the final exam much later in the class. But so obviously we have C8H18. We can think of it a few different ways. Um, one of the keys is if you replace one of these with the OH group. So we have CH2OH and that becomes the alcohol. So the one thing with the alcohol is you're removing an H and replacing it back you're just kind of wedging an O between the H that originally was there and the hydrocarbon name. Um, so we're keeping the H count the same with the alcohol. Sometimes you might see um, the alcohols written as, say, C8H17OH, and obviously that has the same formula. It just depends maybe how you want to express a formula and which way you might symbolically try to represent it. Okay, so we're just going to do this one here and um, together. So H2CO3, think about the name, three. Two, one. What's the name? Yeah, carbonic acid. So sometimes, like when you see the name carbonic acid, I don't know why that one seems confusing when you see it written out. But um, carbonate is just the eight acid. So CO three two minus with two H's would be carbonic acid. This one is actually a tricky one. It's kind of intentionally tricky for where we're at right now. Mercury one chloride. Think of the formula. You're like ten seconds. 
That's what you would think. Try again, though. All right, this isn't the biggest deal in the world, but remember Mercury 1 is one of those common ions that doesn't take the name of Hg+. So this isn't Mercury 1. Mercury 1 is that weird case of two Mercury's fused together with a 2 plus charge. And so then we would write the formula of this as Hg2Cl2. Now, this serves as one actual key reminder, probably more so than re the reminder about mercury, but just that we like to express the formulas of ionic compounds as the empirical formula of the ions, not of the, the elements. So we're thinking this is the empirical formula, like that's the simplest mercury um, um, ion, because the two mercuries are bonded together. So we're not gonna break that down. We're gonna keep this as Hg2Cl2. This is kind of like if we had sodium peroxide. So sodium, NaO2, 2 minus, so I need two sodiums. So if I have sodium peroxide, Na2O2, I'm not gonna reduce that down to NaO. You know what I mean? So I'm not gonna look at, so even if we remember, sometimes you might remember mercury chloride is Hg2 plus, Hg2, two, two plus charge. Um, and then you might simplify the formula down and get rid of the twos. Well, we wouldn't do that on sodium peroxide. We're not gonna do it on Hg2Cl2 either. So we would go with these formulas for these molecules. One last thing for mercury is that mercury two is just ordinary mercury. So if we were to say mercury two chloride, that it is completely what you would expect, and it does actually exist. So mercury two chloride would indeed be HgCl2. So mercury's weird with mercury one, it's completely ordinary with mercury two. And the only key here is that mercury one forms that weird ion that's a little bit different than what we might expect. Mercury two just forms the Hg two plus ion we would expect. Okay, so we had a summary early on of, of formulas that look like this with names, but now we can kind of go through systematically without writing. It's like sodium chloride, aluminum oxide, sodium hydrogen carbonate. You can very easily start to think of the systematic names. What I like to do when I name things is try to think, when I'm looking at something, classify it first. Like if you're not sure how to name something, think is it an ionic compound? Is it a binary molecular compound? Is it a hydrocarbon? Uh, because if you categorize it, it'll help you name it. Uh, so ionic compounds here, so they take metal name followed by the anion name. These are all acids, so they get named as being acids. Notice that if it's an acid, that that like sort of, like we don't look at HCl and call it hydrogen monochloride. You know, like if it fits in the category best as being an acid, we name it as being an acid. If it fits into a category as being a hydrocarbon, notice we don't call C2H6 dicarbon tetra or uh, hexahydride. We call it ethane. So try to look at the categories of the compounds, name them for the category that they fall into. If it's a binary that doesn't fit into an acid name or a hydrocarbon name, then you're just naming it carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, using the binary molecular compound nomenclature. This last one here, we'll do this together instead of on, um, on top hat. But this is just one last example to think about formula and where we write um, parentheses in case we're a bit lost on that. So ammonium is NH4 plus, so NH4 with a positive charge. Phosphate is PO4 with a three minus. So this is just like K3PO4, but the case where we have an NH4 group as the positive charge. So of course we're gonna need three of these to balance out the charge. So that's why we need a parenthesis around the NH4 for three of them, but then we don't need to put the PO4 in parentheses. So if I'm writing out the formula, it'll be NH4, three, PO4. So only if I have more than one of a ion of one of these um, molecular ions do I use the parentheses. This last example is just one last sort of reminder of when and where you're using those parentheses and subscripts. Okay, this is a summary. Read through it if you want to. You can check that out after class. The next chapter up is chemical reactions. So we'll be going through some types of reactions, formulas, and quantifying reaction stoichiometry next week. So that's all for today. You guys have a great weekend. Go Buckeyes. Enjoy the game.